I am uh, Winslow Garish. I am uh, I'm uh, Director of Behavioral Sciences Research and Grants at the Full Circle Health Family Medicine Residency of Idaho in Boise. Um, and uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, although my uh, entire career has been uh, working in uh, GME teaching uh, family medicine and uh, uh, primary care providers about the behavioral appliances. All right, and I, I, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, uh, uh, Hep and substance use disorders. I, um, was overly ambitious in this talk. So there's a ton of content. So we have a couple of choices. I'm either gonna blaze through it uh, remarkably fast um, and uh, not leave any time for questions or I'll skip uh, around a little bit. Um, so we have time to cover things. I'm not a physician. I, am, I know I'm presenting to probably a largely uh, medical providing or prescribing uh, provider uh, group. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting things uh, that I, I think are relevant, I hope are relevant, uh, but some of them are coming from my perspective as a psychologist in terms of what I think may be helpful for you all as you're working with patients with hep C and substance use disorder. So some of this is going to be uh, theoretical and just ways of thinking about this. Uh, some of it will be review for you all. Some of it you'll know more about than I do in terms of opioid assisted therapies or other specifics since I'm not specifically a prescribing provider. So I hope it's useful. That's my caveat. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about kind of stigma and I'm, harm reduction. I'm sorry, Dr. Garish. Lindsay, yeah. can you share this, your screen, please? It could just be us. Oh, it could also just be us. I'm so sorry. I can uh, see it. I think, okay. can you see it? Oh, okay. I think Lindsay's sharing her screen. She'll forward the slides when I, when I give her the signal. Um, is it okay? We'll get it. All right. Um, so we're going to start with kind of the frame. I'm going to move into talking a little bit about kind of some of the, the treatment guidelines around Hep C and uh, folks with uh, active SUD. Uh, talk about some of the literature supporting that. I'm going to talk about the importance of kind of opioid agonist uh, therapy for uh, people uh, who inject drugs uh, and people who use drugs. and um, uh, and have uh, hep C. And then I'm gonna give a, a kind of a, a broad overview of, uh, I guess I'd call it the psychology of addiction um, or the psychology uh, of, um, of compulsive substance use um, and, uh, and just give some broad concepts around that. So go ahead to the next slide. Um, so first, I guess I don't probably really need to say this, but the, the impact of substance use disorders in uh, our community in the United States is, is pretty massive. Um, the highlights on this is just treatments uh, are strongly associated with improved outcomes and reduced uh, impact, negative you know, impacts on our community in terms of cost and social cost and uh, disease. And that stigma is often the, the major reason why uh, cited for why people aren't uh, engaged uh, in treatment uh, or don't seek treatment um, uh, or follow through with it. Go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to move into talking about uh, kind of stigma because uh, I think I'm starting with that because I think it's one of the most important. So there's uh, the people who uh, use drugs and have hep C are really facing a double whammy because with hepatitis C, there's also a huge uh, uh, negative impact of stigma. Uh, hep C is associated with all kinds of things in our, kind of in the US culture that have a, a really strong cultural import. So, you know, alcohol and drug use, um, sex, sex and sexual partners, gender and gender identity, race, uh, things that are, you know, you're not supposed to talk about in polite company at the dinner table. Um, and uh, things that where there's a long history and impact of discrimination and prejudice. Because of that, uh, people with a substance use disorder and hep C, are, they're, they're, they kind of, it leads to a lot of self-denigrating beliefs and behavior. So patients that you're working with are facing that internally, a lot of shame, insecurity, fear, that drives on unhealthy coping. Uh, you know, when we don't feel good, we do things to try to make ourselves feel better. Sometimes that's, you know, have a drink or, 
uh, try to relax in some way that can then worsen the disease or increase the risk of the disease. And um, that it's also strongly correlated, correlated with uh, future psychiatric diagnosis. So you can kind of, you're all familiar with that spiral. Um, and that is probably when you look at the literature, one of the largest barriers to care and complicating factors in treating. Okay, next slide. So to reduce stigma, one of the first things we can do as providers is uh, be really aware of the language we use. Words matter a ton uh, when talking about, I'm gonna focus on people with uh, substance use. Uh, and so moving to person first language. So instead of saying addict or abuse or abuser or alcoholic, saying person who uses drugs, person who uses alcohol, person who uses uh, et cetera. Um, instead of saying, you know, relapse or uh, falling off the wagon or things like that, using having nuance in that language, talking about lapse or uh, um, um, you know, starting uh, to use or having used once uh, instead of always going to relapse. All of that's protective. So I want people to throw into the chat um, some of the some of the I, some of the language that you used uh, or that you are using that that's changed some you know things you used to use to what you've used from addict to person with substance use disorder, anything you can think of. I'm gonna wait for one person to put that in. Even if it's, even if it's Abby or Lisa. Oh yeah, that's a great one. So positive uh, UDS. Um, to say D, right? We would never say, oh, the person's, uh, you know, the person's lab uh, or the person's sample was dirty with glucose, right? Uh, for diabetes. So why do we say that with, with um, a person who's using drugs? And you can go to the next slide. I got one, thank you. Um, uh, so these are other examples. Um, so again, just being really mindful. And I want to, there's a ton of, of, of studies and literature out there as a psychologist. There's two I'm just going to highlight really quickly because they're powerful because it's not only the language that we use and the language that we put in our documentation that impacts how other providers that may be working with that patient think about that person or that the patient may read in their my chart and then think about themselves those all of those combined can lead to unintended consequences so one study was a really simple one where they took a case vignette and they changed the word it was like you know addict for a person with who uses drugs um, and uh, abuse to substance use uh, uh, disorder. And uh, otherwise the vignette was identical. They went to a addiction medicine conference and handed that survey out to those two different versions out to all of the professionals who work in this and care about these patients and want these patients to do better and want to learn uh, through wonderful providers. And sure enough, the one that used person-centered language or person-first language versus the one that used more traditional. When they got to all the questions about prognosis, how likely was a person going to adhere to treatment? How likely were they to get better? Um, There's a significant difference between those two. People thought the, the, the person first, the person who had a substance use disorder was going to do much better, be much more adherent uh, than the other. Another one is a little more subtle. It was an older one. It's a research you could never do now. Um, a group of researchers went into a treatment program and they told the program that they were researchers and they had developed a tool that, could, that they believed could predict prognosis of substance use treatment at greater than 90%. And they wanted to uh, produce uh, R&B reliability and validity data for it in that program. They didn't have a tool, but they interviewed patients coming in prior to treatment and then they told the providers that were working with those patients, this is somebody who our tool said is going to do well. This is somebody who our tool said uh, is not going to do well. And this was somebody who was in the control group and they didn't get, we didn't use our tool with them. And sure enough, the outcomes on those, the patients were blinded to this, but the outcomes just based on the provider's expectations were the group that was, they said was <laughs> gonna do well, did significantly better uh, than treatment as usual. The control group, the people, the ones that they said were a control group, did just the same as treatment as usual. And the ones that they said the prognosis was poor, on the whole, did significantly worse than treatment as usual, based purely on providers' expectations 
Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. So all of that then leads me into kind of talking about the harm reduction model, which I think a lot of you know. So I'm gonna go relatively quick, but looking at the guidelines, um, it, for the most part, hep C treatment is for all patients. Now you can go to the next slide. Um, patients should be offered harm reduction services um, associated with their, uh, uh, with their treatment, uh, with their substance use uh, disorder or substance use um, and then uh, the recent drug use or concern for reinfection is not a contraindication for treatment. Can you can go to the next slide. Uh, so again, an emphasis on uh, counseling patients about harm reduction uh, uh, related to kind of illicit uh, drug use. Um, and then harm reduction principles can be also applied to sexual behaviors uh, and thinking about sexual behaviors. So understanding these principles can help you uh, interact and think about and, and provide counsel to your patients uh, much more effectively and clearly and in a model that is evidence-based and going to give you the best outcomes um, and is the accepted model and principle and approach across kind of all agencies, um, uh, kind of national guilds, professional guilds and agencies, which is the harm reduction model. So I want to look at those principles. Go to the next slide. Um, so that's kind of what I was just talking about. And you can go to the next slide, which, uh, oh yeah, I put this in. Uh, sorry, I forgot. Like I said, I kind of over, went over the top. Related to harm reduction though, is thinking about substance use disorders um, in the fact that they have relapse rates that are the same as a lot of the chronic disease. You can go to the next slide. So we think about them differently. And when somebody relapses, we feel differently about that person. We can't help that. It's built into our, it's how we were socialized. Um, but if you look at relapse rates across uh, for old language, drug addiction, or for substance use disorder across other chronic diseases, those relapse rates are very, very similar. Um, okay, now back to harm reduction. Sorry, that was my little interlude. So these are the eight principles. The eight principles have been refined over the years. Um, this used to be really controversial when I was in graduate school. There'd be, you go to conferences and there'd be big arguments about, about this, and maybe there still are. I haven't heard them in a long time. But I just want to read these. So, except for better or for worse, that illicit, that licit and illicit drug use is part of our world and choose and <coughs> part of our world and chooses to work to minimize its harmful effects rather than simply ignore or condemn them. Understand drug use as a complex, multifaceted phenomena that encompasses a continuum of behaviors from severe use to total abstinence and everything in between, and acknowledges that some ways of using drugs are clearly safer than others. Establishes quality of individual and community life and well being, not necessarily cessation of all drug use, as the criteria for successful intervention and policy calls for the non-judgmental, non-coercive provision of services and services to people who use drugs and the communities in which they live in order to assist them in reducing attendant harm. Next slide. Oh, go back one. There's eight of those. Ensures that people who use drugs and those with a history of drug use routinely have a real voice in the creation of programs and policies for them. Affirm people who use drugs uh, themselves as the primary agents of reducing the harms of their drug use and seeks to empower for people who use drugs to share information and support each other in strategies which meet their actual conditions of use. Recognize that the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex-based discrimination, and other social inequalities affect both people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively dealing with drug-related harm and does not attempt to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and danger that can be associated with illicit drug use. All right, I know that was pedantic, but those are fundamental. Those are uh, absolutely fundamental. Go to the next slide. Um, so this, I'm not gonna belabor, um, but just these are nice questions I think for you as providers, you can just think through like risk, what's the risk itself set? What's the mindset of the person that's in front of you? Where are they at? And then what's the setting? And you, there's a list of questions there. And some of these can be really, really tricky, right? Like I used to do pre-transplant psychological evaluations when I was at the Portland VA, pre-liver pre transplant psychological evaluations. And the 
you know, you can get into really nuanced ethical um, deliberations over that first. Like, what is the risk? Um, you know, should they even having one drink is a huge risk with, you know, in stage liver disease. Or, yeah. So you can get into that. But um, anyway, helpful questions. Go on to the next slide. Okay. Now uh, I want to talk about barriers of care. So now with this harm reduction, you really, uh, if you're working with somebody who has hep C, who has a substance use disorder, it's important to pay attention to that whole person and that whole picture. And access to care is one of the, the largest barriers to uh, improvement around hep C and, and improving hep C outcomes in our population. And that's especially true in rural areas, which uh, a lot of you are from. Um, and so thinking through like this kind of loss to follow up, missed opportunities, adherence issues, all these things that are, are, are barriers to care um, uh, are, are, are all the things you are all facing all the time and, and trying to figure out that's why this echo exists. Trying to increase re resources, increase support, develop integrated care, having behavioral health embedded, all of those things are uh, really important. Barriers uh, in the past era, you know, the interferon era, this kind of barriers uh, around exclusions for people who had a substance use disorder and a behavioral health, that dual diagnosis uh, population were a big deal. And there's still a lot of beliefs out there, even though that hasn't been true for a long time. Uh, so understanding that and or patients who just think I can't get treated um, uh, uh, and kind of debunking that. And then next slide, one last kind of barrier to care um, that's uh, that comes up is around racial disparities that exist in testing and treatment and outcomes. Um, and this, and with hep C is, uh, uh, and with substance use disorders is especially true in the African-American populations. And so it's important, I think, for all of us to remember that those disparities don't exist. Those are not a, uh, there's no biological difference. That's not due to any sort of biological difference between one racial group or another racial group. And so those, ex those differences exist, it's a whole separate talk, but those differences exist because of racial discrimination, racism, and social and structural determinants of health. And so as providers, again, thinking broadly before we move down into the specifics, being aware of that, taking steps to manage or address social determinants of health, structural determinants of health, be aware of where systemic issues or our own personal biases play into that, whether we're conscious or whether conscious or unconscious, it's really, really critical to improving health outcomes uh, and working with that dual diagnosis population. All right, next slide. Okay, now we'll get in, start moving down a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, injection drug use accounts for a huge, uh, is a, has a huge impact on, on hep C. So you're gonna be, if you're treating hep C, you're gonna be, uh, treating people who inject drugs. Um, and uh, so those, uh, those numbers are, are just really high. I'm not, you can see them there. Uh, and then people who use drugs, not, not inject, who don't inject drugs, but use other drugs, um, have a lower risk that you can see that confidence interval for the one study I cited there uh, is, is broad, um, but that can happen uh, through other contamination. And you have to really start to think about treatment of the substance use disorder as prevention of hep C. So treating, uh, I think getting opiate assisted therapies out and into primary care and getting more people doing it and doing it in conjunction with treatment of hep C is critical as we move forward. Um, I'm not gonna be giving a, going into depth on X waivers and all of that, but it's just critical to understand that. Next slide. Um, so now because of that relationship between substance use disorders, a dual diagnosis and a psychiatric diagnosis uh, in combination with hepatitis C, it's also really important to understand these are data that came out of the VA, um, but, um, but the, the, this is uh, patients, uh, veterans with hepatitis C who also have a comorbid uh, psychiatric diagnosis. So you see those rates are really high depending on which studies, but almost any study you look at, um, those are really, really high. Um, and so that prevalence of dual diagnosis, SUD plus mental health issue, and in conjunction with hepatitis C is, is really high. And having skills and ways to address that are, are important. Okay. You all know all that. Um, this, this just goes, I can, I can skip over this. This goes over kind of dual diagnosis, SUD plus mental health, and kind of the rates and prevalence of that. 
Um, and then some of the reasons they don't, some of the reasons this, this dual diagnosis population doesn't seek out um, treatment for their mental health care. Again, a, relate, a lot of it's related to stigma or access and cost insurance. Go to the next slide. This is the same with the people with a substance use disorder out of that dual diagnosis. Uh, and you can see a lot of those are um, their own kind of uh, access issues as well as that interpersonal issue of, of the largest group being not ready to stop using. Um, and that's something you need to be able to talk openly and honestly with, that's that harm reduction model. That's why that model is so important and why the outcomes when you approach things with that, uh, you get such better outcomes overall. Okay, next slide. How am I doing on time? Okay, I gotta keep going. Um, uh, this um, just looks at number of cases and, and age. This is, I think, data a lot of you know, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, this was in, this is the, the epidemiology in Idaho, um, so that the male and female, this may be hard to, to see. Um, so this is 2006 on the top and then 2018 uh, on the bottom and just uh, 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 HCV prevalence uh, by age and sex. Um, and so you can see that efforts uh, um, to treat hep C and the efficacy of those meds is really high. And next slide. Um, all right, so now I want to get a, a little bit into the data around um, uh, opiate-assisted therapy for people who inject drugs. Uh, and I'm not going to belabor the, these studies too much um, uh, a, because of I want to get to other stuff. Um, and so um, essentially, the, the take-home from this is that um, uh, is that uh, opiate-assisted therapies work with the, you know, the patient populations um, uh, and uh, for people who inject drugs. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. I'm going to kind of, again, skip through these because of time. Um, and that you get high cure rates um, uh, from hep C, uh, even with suboptimal uh, uh, adherence. Um, this study was... Uh, this one, yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's the next uh, the next slide, but you you uh, you also get um, increased quality of life. So you get higher these higher cure rates uh, and increased quality of life for people who inject drugs, even with suboptimal adherence. The point of this, uh, in my mind, is uh, is one is that opiate assisted treatments. Um, we, we need, need to be expanded and need to be used, and people with hep C need to be uh, treated regardless um, uh, uh, of their kind of of their status or of their um, uh, of their use. So, go, as long as you can get them into treatment and get them moving forward. All right, I'm going fast. Um, so these are those take homes. So opiate assisted therapy is extremely effective. Um, and uh, yeah, from a public health standpoint, it's extremely effective uh, across all those. And it by itself for opiate use disorder is, uh, is an effective treatment. It uh, doesn't need to be a conjunction. You don't need to be requiring your patients go, you know, uh, if you're providing opiate assisted treatment, you don't need, they don't have to go to counseling. You don't discontinue that because they're, you know, they were in counseling and then they stopped going to counseling. Those kinds of things are not in some other treatment program. Opiate assisted uh, therapy, the, all the research shows is standalone effective at, from a harm reduction perspective. That's not to say that certain individuals or people wouldn't benefit from uh, being involved in a group, being involved, having a supportive community, having working in one-on-one -on -one in psychotherapy, addressing other dual diagnose, you know, psychiatric diagnoses of their depression or PTSD that may be driving some of that substance use, maybe increasing their risk for, uh, uh, you know, for hep C or maybe uh, making their adherence to the hep C treatments uh, more problematic. So it's not to say that they, that it's not for everybody, but opiate assisted treatment uh, uh, is effective um, and is effective standalone. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the other component uh, is around drinking. Um, and I, I think I'm intimidated to talk about this because of the other people that I'm, are on the panel here with me. I can speak to this more 
uh, um, more definitively. But my understanding is that uh, uh, cure rates uh, with for Hep C, uh, regardless of a person's alcohol use, um, are still very high, as uh, indicated here, and that um, alcohol use. Uh, the relationship between alcohol use and hepatitis C and progression in the liver uh, is, isn't totally understood, that there is, um, uh, that it's not totally predictive. So there is, uh, again, I can't speak to that uh, as effectively, so I'm going to, um, uh, uh, I'm going to keep, keep going. But the, the point being that you can get uh, high cure rates for hep C and, and folks who are drinking should be treated. Um, okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, non-pharmacologic treatments and ways of thinking what I was saying around just the psychology of substance use um, or the psychology of, of uh, why people uh, use substances. Um, so some of these around treatment are really important to remember as you're working with people treating their hep C and trying to figure out how to help them with their substance use disorder that may be reoccurring. So one, no treatment is appropriate for all individuals. There's no silver bullet for uh, treating an SUD. Treatments uh, ideally are readily available. That's much harder in, in, in the rural United States. Um, treatment needs to attend to the multiple needs of an individual, not just their substance use. Um, multiple courses of treatment are often needed uh, for success, um, and that remaining in treatment for an adequate period of time is, is often critical. And so helping reduce barriers and, in, and increase the ability of people to stay in treatment um, uh, is a critical thing. It's not necessarily the person's fault that they are not uh, in or that the treatment isn't working. Okay. Time check. I'm doing okay. All right. Uh, I should say that uh, if there are any questions or I'm going too fast, or you want to go back to anything, uh, feel free to jump in and interrupt me. I don't mind that at all, um, despite talking fast. Um, okay, so types of treatment. Uh, so we covered a, a bit around medication. Um, uh, brief counseling. Brief counseling for substance, and this is treatment for substance use disorder. So this is thinking of getting treatment in, in conjunction with um, uh, treating somebody's uh, uh, hep C. Uh, brief counseling. Brief counseling can sometimes be one or two sessions of talking with a, um, a, you know, a behavioral health provider of some sort, uh, whatever you have access to. Sometimes it literally one or two sessions uh, every so often is sufficient to help people. It can help with uh, adherence um, to treatments. It can help if you have somebody embedded in your clinic or somebody that a mental health care provider that has some understanding of hep C and its treatment or that you have time to explain it to. So somebody you can collaborate with and they can take more time to kind of lay out why it's so important to ad adhere to treatment. And if they're not able to adhere that letting their provider know is a really good thing and hiding it from their provider isn't going to help anybody. It just, you know, sometimes a few brief sessions with somebody that can spend longer with the patient than you're able to, or to augment what you're doing, is all that's needed to, to get their studies that show that can, you can get really good treatment outcome just from something as simple as that. Sometimes longer treatment, um, you know, eight or 12 sessions of psychotherapy uh, uh, is more needed or more useful. Um, there's a lot of different treatments out there. There are specific CBTs for uh, chronic disease and adherence to medications. There's um, CBTs specifically that have been developed around chronic disease that can be applied or used if people know them. In Idaho, it's much harder to, to find people with that kind of specialty knowledge in the mental health care and behavioral health care field. Uh, if you have access to that, that's fantastic. But sometimes just a, a general uh, person, a general provider who uh, ha can provide CBT and address um, or even provide supportive psychotherapy to a patient, uh, but talk to them openly about their substance use disorder uh, and their hep C treatment can, is enough to get them kind of through. There are group therapy options, AA, Smart Recovery Skills Group, Women for Sobriety. There's lots of different ones that work with different populations. Um, AA tends to be abstinence-based um, and kind of has a, a higher power or 
uh, uh, you know, kind of Judeo-Christian kind of slant to it. There's, but it's free. It's everywhere. There's lots of different groups. There's groups for lawyers. There's groups for parents. There's groups for bikers. You know, so, um, uh, but it isn't for everyone, uh, and it is very much an abstinence-based model. Smart recovery is a more harm reduction model, uh, and pulls from uh, kind of more current or recent literature around uh, substance use. Um, so it's really around what you have access to. The next is relapse prevention. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But relapse pr prevention um, is uh, is kind of the gold standard. And I'm, I want to because hopefully for a lot of you, you'll be working with people uh, occasionally at least who are have quit or in the process of quitting, and really focusing on giving them skills around managing lapse and relapse. Uh, increase improving their efficacy as they work through that cycle um, and normalizing that cycle so that lapse and relapse are part of that process of treatment for them um, will be a helpful thing for you and a helpful thing uh, for them. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna have a ton of time to go into this, but I do wanna think about like what makes something addictive. Um, and the, um, and I have that in quotes there, what makes something addictive? And there are a few uh, components of this. We, um, there's like the DSM-5 diagnosis of a, of a substance use disorder. Keep in mind, being dependent or being physiologically dependent or in withdrawal is not a criteria for something being uh, kind of use or problematic use. Um, so really it's around, is that person using, it, it centers around the, all the DSM criteria uh, for diagnosis center around, is, is that person continuing to use when it is a problematic for them, when it's not, not in their best interest or is causing themselves or their community harm, it's not moving them forward in their life in a way that's consistent with their values or their goals. Um, and so what is it that causes somebody to do that? So. Um, I want to think about a couple things here. In the literature, uh, this idea of uh, substance use, endogenous versus ex ex exogenous rewards, people will say, well, like gambling or shopping or other behaviors, food or sex are addictive in the same way that a substance is addictive. And there's, there's, uh, there is controversy around that. There's not a lot of literature around the exogenous reward. People do argue that those are kind of triggering the same reward pathway in our brain. Um, and, you know, essentially you're getting a, 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 a dump of dopamine in the nucleus of cummins and you feel really great uh, um, when you engage in those or use it as a way to reduce uh, internal stress or anxiety. Um, but, but thinking about those, uh, that, that those things are, are, there is overlap, but those are distinct. And we don't have a ton of, um, a ton of data around those exogenous uh, um, kind of addictions or behavioral addictions or compulsive behaviors that people talk about. But you, so you have to think about those separately, even though the lay language people will overlap those. One way that those can be related is that there is, for some people at least, there is a, the theory is that there is a, those, there's a, a kind of a, a, a lack of uh, or a, a lack of strength and in inhibitory pathways between kind of your frontal lobe and limbic structures of your brain, emotion, memory, et cetera. And that those, that those, if those inhibitory pathways um, are not as strong in certain individuals, that they're mo more predisposed both to substance use and problematic substance use and potentially engaging in these more compulsive behaviors. Um, that's a separate subject. Then the other thing on here that I want to pull out Two other things, substance use is just thinking about for people who use drugs, that the primary effect of the drug and the reward of the drug are, are separate, they're distinct. So meaning, uh, you know, I think we all know this, uh, but helping patients sometimes understand this can be useful in that, uh, you know, one person could um, use a, an amphetamine and, you know, their mind races, their heart beats fast, their palms are sweaty, and they feel great. They feel like they, everything they're saying is brilliant. They feel like they have, they have, they're going to solve all these problems in their life, and they, they feel great. Another person can have those same physiologic effects. Their heart races, their mind is racing, their palms are sweaty, and they feel terrible. They feel anxious. They feel like they can't control things. They feel scattered. 
Uh, and so that, that person who the reward is lower is less likely to develop a, a, a compulsive habit around or a compulsive use of that substance. So the primary effect and the, the a reward effect uh, for, the, for individuals are, are somewhat separate. And sometimes it's helpful to help patients uh, understand or think about that. Um, and then in addition to that though, uh, addictive behaviors or this developing a, a pattern of substance use that is problematic is thinking about substance use as this kind of progressive neuroadaptive condition. So if somebody is you know, drinking alcohol and they start out just drinking a little bit, their system gets used to that, it's not problematic. But as their system gets used to that over time, even years, that can lead to a little bit more to a little bit more, sometimes not to, you know, into that kind of misuse category where it's negatively affecting their health, but they can't reduce it. Or they get diagnosed with, you know, fatty liver disease or some kind of liver disease and they're, they know that they need to stop drinking and even having a couple drinks a week is bad and they just keep doing it. They can't shut that down. Um, and so that's that idea that the, 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 the chronic or persistent substance use in the presence of, uh, of harm um, is this idea that anybody can ultimately develop. It's this progressive neuroadaptive condition that, that people can develop over time. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, that's kind of what we were just talking about, just that NIDA definition. Um, so you can keep going. I think I'm gonna make it. No, I'm already over time, aren't I? Um, okay, uh, so this is just another, like I said, like ways of thinking about addiction. Uh, and this is taking a, another model used for something else, but uh, I this was presented to me by one of my mentors whose career was spent um, working and Reese was a psychologist, a researcher at the University of Washington, uh, researching um, uh, substance use. And uh, I thought this was a really helpful thing. So a lot of times I'll put this up and then have it animated so you don't know which is which. But if you ask yourself, this is just a reflection exercise, where do you fall on this? So is the person responsible for developing uh, their addictive behavior? Uh, yes or no. And is the person responsible for changing their addictive behavior? Kind of yes or no. And these are imperfect, I understand that. But you can kind of see how these fall out. And then most of us as care providers are probably somewhere in the bottom, one of the bottom two, right? Either the compensatory model, I kind of find myself in that. They're not responsible for developing the addictive behavior. I understand there's old language in this. So I haven't updated this slide. Um, and then, uh, but they are responsible for, for addressing it, doing something about it. They're responsible for their behaviors um, uh, and continuing to work on it. Uh, and then there's also that disease model. And I think in a lot of medicine, and there's literature around that disease model um, that really there's, um, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're caught in this disease that's uh, gonna be kind of just moving forward with them. Um, however, we're down there. If you think about now your patient, um, where are your patients coming in? And this can have a huge impact on that. You may be all ready to go and you're down here but they're coming in and whether they verbalize it or not, most people in our community and your patients' loved ones and their parents and their partners and their kids are up in those top two. Um, they feel like they are morally corrupt when they, because they use or if they relapse. Um, and that drives really negative emotions. They feel like they are a spiritual failure or that their God or the person or thing or entity that they are, uh, that has power over them and their life and the world is, is uh, you know, that they're in sin or in their loss of contact with that. Think about how devastating that is and think what kind of emotions that drives and what kind of behaviors that drive, even to the fact that they may not be ever talking to you about that. So being able to just, you, you're not going to lay this model out for patients necessarily, but having your mind like, where am I at? Where are they at? And then how are we going to, how are we going to move those together so that I'm not totally missing them and they're not totally missing me and what I'm trying to do. But I find that a really helpful thing when I just go in to talk with somebody about substance use. Um, so hopefully that's helpful to you. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is data around what drives relapse. Now this is more nerdy psychology stuff, so I don't know how useful this is. However, 
This is old data, but it's been uh, reproduced in, in different, uh, different uh, capacities multiple times. So, but this was looking at what, what people who were using substances or using drugs, uh, what became high risk situations for them to then use again, where their urges or their cravings or their actual use started to go up. Um, and if you look at there, let's say for, um, and again, there's old language in this, this is from 1985, apologize, but, um, but if you look at these, uh, let's say for alcohol, negative emotional states um, are the intrapersonal, the highest intrapersonal determinant. So that again, stigma, all those things we were talking about, um, you know, discrimination, prejudice, racial discrimination, those negative internal emotional states are a huge driver for urges, cravings, things to use again. And then interpersonal things, again, is conflict and pressure. Those are the highest rates. So for alcohol, 18%, 18% um, uh, that, that make up uh, the highest uh, kind of circumstances in which a person is likely to use again. So understanding that and then being able to help somebody anticipate and then if they have a last, anticipate those situations, either avoid them or start to build skills to address them. Just knowing that they're gonna come ahead of time helps them then manage those earlier. And if, even if they do have a lapse, it reduces that lapse and it increases their, the, or it decreases the amount of time it takes for them to re-engage uh, in not using or using in a safer way. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, and this is super nerdy psychology stuff, uh, but this, uh, this is kind of the cognitive model for how relapse prevention strategies work. Um, and so again, this is just for you to be thinking about as somebody, if so, you have somebody who is currently not using or has reduced their use uh, significantly and is trying to not use more, um, this is what they're facing. This is the cognitive map for that. So if a person is in a high risk situation, and um, uh, and they're, uh, they have an ineffective coping response. So they don't anticipate it, it catches them off guard. They are, find themselves with peer pressure. They find themselves at a fight with their, um, their partner and the partner kicks them out of the house and they're driving around late at night. They don't know where to go. And that like the next thing they do, they don't, and they, they don't realize like all of a sudden those urges to use that negative emotional, that negative, negative affective space is gonna put them in a place where they have a less sense, they have decreased self-efficacy. They feel like they can't, things are out of control. They can't control it. What do they do to control it? They tend to revert back to old coping skills. One of those may be drinking alcohol. Say midnight, they got kicked out of their house after a big fight, they show up to the bar. They're like, I'm just gonna have a beer. I'm just gonna to talk to my buddies that are here, not gonna drink. One thing leads to another. They have an abstinence violation. They have an, the abstinence violation effect, which is further shame, further negative affect, which then drives them to say, well, I had one, might as well have, I might as well just get wasted. I might as well go on a bender. So increased probability of moving from lapse to full relapse from that abstinence violation effect into uh, continued problematic use. Whereas the idea with it, with relapse prevention skills is this idea that you're going to help people anticipate that, give them skills, give them an increased sense of self-efficacy. And even if there is a small abstinence violation, that the abstinence violation effect does not kick in and they're able to pull themselves back out of that, figure out, have other coping skills, and it decreases the probability of a, a problematic or unhealthy relapse. Okay. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, this is just about aversion therapy and why you shouldn't do it. Um, uh, so like for you all, disulfiram, I just, just don't, aversion therapy doesn't work. It gets you really rapid results um, uh, initially, and then people tend to return over time, they tend to return at a higher than baseline rate of use. Um, so, uh, you know, that like putting somebody in having them smoke 12 packs in a day until they get sick or giving disulfiram so that they throw up when they drink alcohol. Uh, as soon as they stop that, then their, their rate of use bounce, rebounds and, and ends up being higher than their previous baseline. Um, so we can skip that. Oh, this is just an example of, so this comes out of the smart recovery groups, which are also free and located in different areas around the country. Um, I don't know how, how, how many of, they're kind of like the AA model, they're all peer run. 
But this is an idea of just what a real base, very basic relapse prevention strategies would look like. And this is that I pulled this up offline off their website. But these are things that you can walk through with a patient just to help them give them some sense of efficacy. So what are their triggers? What kind of euphoric recall would they have associated with their kind of a, a drug of choice? That's old language, I don't like that. Um, but, um, uh, and then what are unhelpful thought patterns that they have around, around all of that? What are, uh, and then go to the next slide. Uh, that's the rest of the worksheet. Um, so what are the, those thoughts? And what, are, and what are emotions? I always do emotions associated with those thoughts. How does that make you feel? Um, and then what could they do instead? What could they think instead? Um, what are other strategies? What are behaviors? So behaviors and thoughts. Um, and um, so that's just an example. There's, there's lots of those out there, or you can find a professional to partner with that can help with those kinds of substance use as you're treating everybody, except for people who are gonna die within six months for hep C. Um, okay. I gave 10 minutes, I think that's my last slide. Um, treat, treatment of hep C should be the same for persons with active or prior substance use. Absence is not um, required for treatment. SUD does not mean that someone can't adhere. Um, you, opiate assisted therapy uh, is great and is a treatment in and of itself. Harm reduction is the most evidence-based approach and words matter. Okay, I think that's it. Awesome. Thank I'm, happy, you. I'm happy to take any questions or we can move on. To, I'm sorry I took so much time. No, that was great. Um, that was really helpful. I imagine that there are some questions. I have one to start out just thinking about language. Um, you are using OAT rather than MAT. Is that a better term? Um, does it matter in any way? I think OAT is, yeah, is the... Um, in, at least in the world of psychology and the behavioral sciences is kind of a, you know, words change over time, right? That's the nature of language. Anything you associate with something that has a social stigma or cultural, negative cultural import will eventually become a, what was a good word becomes a bad word. Um, the idea with medication assisted therapy is that the medication is uh, assisting. And really the, the, I think the idea of opiate assisted therapy is that, um, or opiate, opiate agonist therapy, uh, is more like moving from antidepressant to SSRI. It's more descriptive of what the medication is doing, and it doesn't limit the medication to only being assistive, uh, but that it can be a treatment in and of itself. Um, whereas a lot of time there with, when people had MAT, they would say, well, we, you have to be engaged in counseling. And if you're not, then we're gonna discontinue your MAT. M most people don't do that now, but for a while that was very in vogue. And, um, and so that's thus the language change for better or for worse. Language evolves. Cool, thanks. Do other folks have questions for, for Dr. Garish? We're gonna uh, wait on our patient case, so we have time for questions here. Sorry, sorry, Ian. Hey, no worries. My, my patient case is pretty brief too, so I, it's not a big deal and I'm happy to save it. Um, I actually, so I am moonlighting at the health department um, here in Logan, Utah, and we, um, you know, I recently started this position like a uh, two months ago or so, but we're um, up to this point. They have required that people getting MAT or um, medication for opioid use disorder be in counseling and attend a certain number of counseling sessions. And so I'm trying to work on getting that changed so that they could just get medication if that's what they find helpful. Um, so yeah, I appreciate. I really appreciated your talk. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. I guess on a similar note, I, um, our board of health for the health department, which is the governing body, usually made up of like county commissioners is, uh, I'm presenting them tomorrow, trying to get permission to treat hepatitis C through the health department as well. Um, just because we have a lot of medication assisted therapy patients, we have this grant to do a bunch of hepatitis C screening. And then what are we going to do with these people? There's, um, not a whole lot of treatment for it anywhere in town. I, I think there's um, the gastroenterology group uh, can treat it, but they're overwhelmed with, I mean, we don't have enough specialists here, so. We would, sorry, my dog's barking. We would love to help you uh, treat those patients with hep C uh, virtually anytime, Ian, if, that, if they agree with you. I really appreciate it, Dr. Davids. Yeah, that's awesome, Ian, way to go.
And I, I will say there's so much kind of political, religious, cultural import, uh, especially around substance use disorders, also around hep C, but in different ways. Uh, but it can be really hard for like politicians, policymakers, you know, city council members, um, uh, et cetera, to adapt or change or kind of, you know, they don't really care what the evidence says. They care about how they feel or what they believe about a person who uses uh, drugs. And so um, kudos to you. I mean, we are, this has been moving forward in lots of good ways across the country, but, um, but it's still, still really hard and it can bring up really heated discussions and a lot of emotions and can be tricky. I found this policy paper uh, by some economists on the relative costs of um, uh, and direct anti acting antivirals for hepatitis C versus like normal course of therapy or no treatment. And um, I think there's a pretty strong economic argument that I'm hoping they're going to respond to as well. Just, you know, yep. for, for both PrEP, PEP and, and hepatitis C, which is what we're going to be asking for tomorrow. They should respond, Ian. <laughs> in a positive way. There's a lot of data for that. Yeah. Agree. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. Yeah, help anytime. Other questions for Winslow or, or general questions for us before we wrap up here? Dr. David, Sir Winslow, Ian, even, I'm wondering if I could just ask another question in terms of, you've got the data, the economic data, are there other suggestions as Ian's going forward for some of that, uh, the approach to making a pretty significant culture change? Any other su successful techniques that have been used? I mean, I would say public health arguments you know, for your population and in, in total um, are pretty strong as well. Um, not just um, the individual patients that maybe people will have strong feelings about, like like Winslow was saying, but um, but the health of your of your whole city, right, or your whole township or wherever you are, um, maybe that's a, a way to approach um, these conversations too. Um, yeah, and I, I I agree with that. Um, I think all, in my experience also people respond to or, or react to stories um, and, and then they also react to the narrative from their own life. So almost anybody you're talking to either has or used to use some kind of substance or has an immediate loved one who has or used to, um, they may have a history where that has just ravaged their life um, in one capacity or another. And they are reacting very strongly um, with a lot of emotion because of you know, that history. They've seen alcohol destroy or personally had alcohol destroy their life or ruin a relationship or whatever. Um, and just keeping that in mind as people are talking, they're not, I think as, as healthcare providers, we can get really objective and get into the facts and remember that sometimes these, these folks are talking about, and sometimes that's what they respond to is like, uh, you know, Sometimes they remember they have like a grandchild who is struggling with substance use, but they know is a good person and they love them and they're trying to, and you can just say, yeah, I, I do. That's what we were trying to do with these policies is we're trying to help somebody like your granddaughter who, uh, who is a great person. And that's the whole point of harm reduction is we're, we're, we're being non judgmental about the, you know, so you can tie it into two stories. Sometimes people don't disclose those that's going on in the background. And as far as um, the the counseling group that I'm working with at the health department, I think they um, they seem like a really fantastic group. And I'm not sure how much of the requirement for them to be seeing the people that I'm prescribing, like you know, medication for opioid use disorder stuff to how much of that is a grant requirement and how much of that is an organizational thing. Um, but if it's purely an organizational thing, um, you know, some of them seem potentially responsive to it. But I'm interested if you guys have any good studies that indicate that um, medication alone is effective. I think I can find them as well. But if you have anything that's like, oh, yeah, that, that study in particular is something that you should share with them, I'd be very interested. Yeah, there's the, 
the, the, I think two of them linked in the, in the slide deck. Um, Perfect, I'll check out your references. I talk about that and then I, I, can, I can come up with some others um, as well. And I would say in part in collaborating or partnering or finding a behavioral health provider to, to partner with, sometimes behavioral health providers can really shy away from, uh, and for sometimes for policy or reimbursement reasons, shy away from treating substance use disorders. Even me in an FQHC, uh, if I were to treat a, a substance use disorder as a primary diagnosis in my current clinic, it triggers all this stuff with Medicaid around like I have to have done this and done this, I have to do a you know, gains assessment. And, and so fortunately, almost everybody that I work with who has a substance use disorder also has depression or anxiety or some other psychiatric illness. And I can treat both at the same time uh, and list the psychiatric diagnosis as a, you know, as, as you know, the focus of treatment. If their, if their substance use becomes a focus of treatment, then I need to refer them out to another specialty agency. Um, but, but for a lot of folks I work with, they're in recovery. Um, and that's not the focus of treatment. And so, uh, but people can be a little kind of touchy. So actually just finding out like, what are their demands? What are their concerns? And how could you still work? Could they still, could they, could you teach them about hep C and, and they could just do like a one-off appointment, um, you know, or is there some work around that they would be comfortable with? They're not trying to treat the, take on the entire care of this patient's and their, and their substance use, but just trying to help with adherence or some slice of that that benefits kind of the public health effort uh, in terms of reducing the, the impact of chronic disease. Um, so just kind of thinking through that in terms of collaboration.